glad that Sister McGowan's back. Um, we sure have been missing her. We've been praying for her. And, and we definitely know when someone like her is gone because you can feel there's just not enough strength to, to keep things going. But the Lord always makes up the difference, doesn't he? He sure does. And it's good to see Brother Kyle right over. Raise your hand, Brother Kyle. He's come to visit us. It's good to, so good to see him here and we got sister abraham there with us let's give her a hand yeah and uh it's good to see sister wilson we missed you last week you weren't here so we prayed for you too let's see i think everybody else oh sister cindy yes sister cindy we've missed her we've been we've been praying for Sister Cindy and her family, and our prayers still go out and and keep. Please keep praying for my family. We're still. Uh, I'm going to have to fly back to California Saturday, and I'll be gone for a little while. Uh, I told somebody when I got back. I said, "Man, I'm glad I live in the South. <laughs> Things are just so different there in California." Uh, we haven't even buried my father yet. We couldn't. Not till the 14th of this month. That's the earliest we could do it. Yeah. So California is just a, they have nice people. And, and everyone we talked to was just so nice. But they're just a horse of a different color out there. So, so we're flying back out Saturday, which is the 10th. And, and, and my son Jacob is going to be going with us also. And, and then he'll be coming back the 21st, but my wife and I, we're going to try and stay long enough to settle the estate. And we, we can't even get the death certificate until at least two weeks uh, after he's buried. So there's a lot to, a lot to do. And so keep praying for us. It's, it's, it's not easy to be the executor of a state when you have more than one, one opinion. You know, if there's more than one person involved, uh, it can be difficult, so just keep praying for me, you know, that the Lord would uh, uh, help us. And, and my wife, she's been a peacemaker. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a person, I like to follow the letter of the law, but she's more gracious and more compassionate than I am. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and then, uh, of course, you all saw on Facebook. Did everybody read Facebook this morning? Uh, Okay, Brother Smith, when he was in, in Texas, he was around somebody that was later diagnosed with the COVID virus. That doesn't mean Brother Smith has it, but he was around somebody. So uh, in the, uh, to be perfectly um, oh, follow CDC guidelines and everything else, he felt it would be better for, I mean, I, I, we talked to him this morning, him and Sister Smith, they're perfectly fine. But they just felt, you know, to protect us and to do the right thing, they would self-quarantine uh, and, 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 and get the test and everything. And I expect them to be back real soon, you know. So anyway, I mean, he's okay. Everything's fine. But you know how we, I go through this at work when there's people that, uh, uh, at people uh, at work that we think has been exposed to somebody we either make them get a coded a COVID test, or we make them self quarantine for for 14 days. Now, depending upon what level of employment you're at, if you're more along the management line, we just get a COVID test, and next day we'd be back to work. You know, when you get the results. But some people, because I work for a government entity, uh, we're allowing them to self quarantine for 14 days. So, guess what? All the RLE employees do. No, they self-quarantine for 14 days because they're getting paid. <laughs> you you got you to gotta love the government, you know. But anyway, let's, but it, it looks like everything is okay. But, you know, you got to follow the CDC guidelines and everything. So I don't want anybody to get any weird ideals or anything. So, uh, you know, uh, oh, and I'm uh, next Friday will be my last day at work. I'm, I'm going to finally retire, Brother Talley. I'm going to do it. So uh, that's going to bring a lot of change uh, in our life. 
I've been thinking about it for a while, but with this thing with my father and every all the effort that we're going to have to put into it, um, I just felt that it would be better for me uh, to go ahead. I was going to retire either at Christmas time or in March would be the latest, so I just went a little bit earlier. That and, you know, they're cutting my budget, so that's another reason uh, to go a little bit earlier. Uh, I've always said, uh, it looks like the, the gentleman that's applying for my job, he works for me now, I always said, I said, ah, oh, a monkey could do my job. So I'm thinking of trying to find a little monkey and give it to him. <laughs> that's just my sense of humor. But, um, but, um, but everything else is okay. At, at work we have, um, I do all kinds of stuff. Not only am I over the mechanical department, I do all kinds of other things and we have different terms. We have something called deferred preventive maintenance and deferred maintenance. And preventive maintenance, if you, if you own a home, you do preventive maintenance. If you have uh, air filters uh, in your return air ducts, you've got to change them all the time, especially during uh, the air conditioning season. If you don't, your condenser outside is going to burn up. Uh, there's just all kinds of things to do preventive maintenance. Um, if, if, if you have weeds growing up, your I hate weeds. I don't like them. But if, if, if you have weeds growing in your flower bed, you got, you got to pull them up, you know, otherwise your flower bed gets overtaken. And then, um, and then we have regular maintenance, things that break. But deferred preventive maintenance means we don't either have the time, the money, or the manpower, or the ability to go in and do preventive maintenance. And we do everything from replace uh, belts on drive shafts before they break. A lot of times if a big air handler that air conditions a school, some of these air conditioners are half as, half as big again as this, uh, this room in here and, and they have these big drive belts and if a belt just happens to break, guess what? The air conditioner for that part of the school goes down. So a lot of times we'll go in, do preventive maintenance, we inspect the belts and if the belt looks like it's getting worn, it may not be breaking yet, but we go ahead and replace it. And we do little things like all these drinking fountains that you see all over the place. Uh, it's really odd and you don't see it, but we see it all the time. On the inside, they have these coils. It's a little uh, coil uh, that's very important for the operation of that uh, electric drinking fountain. And over time, through foot traffic and running a vacuum cleaner and dust and stuff, fan, uh, the fan pulls air through this, uh, this coil, okay? It's called the condenser coil. And it'll actually build up, it looks like a wool blanket on the outside of it. And it will cause not as large of airflow through this coil. And if it finally gets to the place where there's no air going through this coil to cool the condenser down, your condenser will burn up. So we go and we pull the cover off of the, uh, the drinking fountain and we clean this off. That's preventive maintenance. And if you don't do preventive maintenance, what we call deferred preventive maintenance, things are going to break down when they shouldn't have. And then my job is to make sure that the schools are open and they can, that, you know, there's warm, safe, and dry. So to us, preventive maintenance is very important. And when they, when we can't do it, we all start cringing because we know sooner or later, things that shouldn't break down are going to break down. And it's the same way with deferred maintenance. When something breaks down, they just recently uh, froze my budget, and uh, we, uh, it's going to be difficult the rest of this year because we're going to have to uh, decide what we want to repair and what we want to do. We have to make those choices. That, so um, anyway, the kingdom of God is, is, is like this too. And the reason I'm saying this is, is I want us to turn over to, let's turn over to Acts, the first chapter. And uh, we're not going to look at it right now, but in Ecclesiastes it says, there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. 
And then there's, it goes on to say, I can't quote it, it said there's a time for love, there's a time for hate, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time for planting, there's a time for uh, reaping. And all these things are natural things, but there's a, a natural uh, progression of things. And that's what, the, there's a time and a season for everything that happens under, 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 the, under heaven. God made it that way. It's just like there's four seasons, summer, winter, uh, spring, and fall. God set it up that way. It's a natural progression of things. And so it is in the kingdom of heaven, uh, in the ministry, and, and following God. There are times and there are seasons when either uh, certain doctrines, certain gifts, certain uh, ministries are more needed uh, in a local church and in the body. Just like it is in natural things, it's, it's that way in spiritual things. And we have to know what that time is. We can't let that time overtake us because a lot of what is done, and I appreciate so much what Brother Smith has been talking on, uh, the book of Revelation and the end times, the, the 13 things that have to be done. I think I'm getting that figure right. The 13 things that uh, still needs to happen uh, before the end uh, and what it's going to take uh, for the church to be restored and what a restored church is going to look like. If you haven't been coming to Bible study and if you haven't been following these things, you're going to be one of these that uh, are we will possibly be ill prepared when that time comes. I've been loving the teachings and the preachings from Brother Smith and, and the other brethren here because they've been tying in to his message and and they know uh, that the pastor of a church it's just like where I work there's a my boss he has a vision of what we're going to do in the schools and 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 how we're going to be more efficient and he he'll he'll lay out that vision for us he's not a plumber and but he has people uh, he has a, master electricians, he has master plumbers, he has uh, HVAC people, he has crowns, he has all these people. He'll lay out the vision of what he expects to happen this year and the things that we're going to do to cause these things to happen. And it's us to up, it's us to up to, it's us up to us. <laughs> I apparently need more coffee. <laughs> or maybe I've had too much coffee. I don't know. Brother Crafton's shaking his fist at us. Uh, it, it's up to it's up to those of us in management to understand his vision for the school district and to implement it and to supply the people that work underneath us with their part of the vision and the tools and equipment and the training that they need so that the whole vision can be accomplished. Thank you so much. We'll see if this helps or hurts. And that, that's how it is in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, God deals with the pastor of a church. God doesn't come down and sit on his bed, but how I've seen God deal with Brother Smith, Brother Smith will become interested in a certain subject in the Bible. I remember years ago, it's probably been, let's see, Ruth is 29. It's been right at 30 years ago, uh, Brother Smith became very interested in the little book of Ruth. And he spent months and months digging into the book of Ruth. And that's all we heard for several months. But it was in season. God had dealt with him, and I feel like all of us have. He's, he's talked on the book of Ruth here before. We've all uh, gained a lot knowing about Elimelech and Balon and Kilion and, and Ruth and Orpah and uh, all these other things and about the harvest. And uh, we now know uh, we have a greater understanding of what uh, the type and the shadow that that is for us. It really happened, but we can use it now, and in, it, increase, it increases our vision. So God gave Brother Smith a small piece of the whole picture 
but we've all benefited from it. So I've seen over the years when Brother Smith becomes uh, interested in a subject, that's usually the direction God is taking this church and maybe, maybe, maybe the whole body, maybe everybody in the body will be interested. I've seen that before. Everyone, everyone will be thinking about, not everyone, but a good part of the uh, leading brethren and ministers, they'll be, they've had, they've been talking about this one subject. It just seems like God can move the whole body in that direction, not because God came down and said, I want you to study the book of Ruth. You just feel an unction from the Holy One. You start doing that. Well, in, in Acts, but you have to be able to, as a minister, you have to be able to discern that. And that doesn't mean that nothing but, but prophetic subjects can be talked on. There's a balance to everything. Someone said, you can have enough of the word of the God, but too little of the, the spirit of God. And, and that's, that doesn't create a good balance. We know that a just balance is of the Lord. Um, and, uh, or you can have uh, enough of the Spirit of God and too little of the Word of God, and that creates an on, uh, not an unjust balance, but it, it, it will create a balance that, uh, a disbalance that will hinder um, that church from going on. You, you need an even balance. So, so we, uh, we try to fi uh, follow Brother Smith and his leadings, but then at times we, God, We'll deal with one of us, either through a song or a testimony or something. We'll go for another direction. But haven't you noticed that here recently, probably for the last year, uh, the emphasis has been on prophetic subjects. And But we'll always veer off because we need moves of the Spirit. We need uh, all these other things. But over in Acts, the first chapter, let's see. All right. In fact, Brother, uh, Brother Painter used this scripture uh, very adequately last week. And uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. This is, um, well, I'll just read this. And being assembled together with them, commanded them, this is Jesus talking, and he commanded the apostles this is before he was going to leave and be caught up into heaven. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, which is the apostles along with those that were following him, no doubt the 120 were there, and uh, um, when they were therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And that was a good, valid question. But that's not, it wasn't season for that teaching right then. There was, it was a season for Christ to prepare the hearts and the minds for his apostles and the 120 to receive the Holy Ghost. In fact, in the book of Psalms, we won't go to it because I'm not going to talk about that, but it, it, the whole, the whole uh, time of Christ when he was here on the earth up until the day of Pentecost uh, deals with it. And there's one scripture that says, Then he restored that which he took not away, which was the Holy Ghost. Up until that time, man could serve God outwardly with head knowledge, but no one up until the coming of Christ since the fall of Adam had had the indwelling, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost had moved upon people, like it said, holy men of old, you know, the Holy Spirit would move upon them, and that's how they would prophesy. Uh, um, and we all know that. I'm not going to get off on that there. But these people wanted to know uh, if the kingdom was going to be restored at this time. And I like, Jesus knew exactly what season it was because he just got done saying he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. 
For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And here they come. They still have in their mind a natural kingdom. They didn't know what time it was. They didn't know what season it was. I'm talking about spiritually. In fact, one place, and this must have dumbfounded them, Jesus said, look out onto the fields for they're white with harvest. You know, they're, they're, they're ready to harvest. And it, those that were with him looked out and they said, but Lord, it's still, it's still three months to the harvest. And how can you say that it, it's, it's, uh, it's white, that the fields are white on the harvest? They were seeing things naturally, but Christ knew exactly what the season was and what those people needed. And that's the job of the ministry to feel on God and help us to know what season it is. If it's a season for prophecy, we work in that area. If it's a season, and I've been feeling this myself and so have many people, it, it's, it's getting to the season for God to add people to the church. Brother Smith has talked about it. And I would like to see us, you know, we have a wonderful gospel here. And the people here are just wonderful people. And it still surprises me that we don't have 10,000 people in this one little area just come in. Well, God's getting this ready. We can only handle, we can only handle so many new people as we're able to handle. Well, you know, God's, God's not going to uh, add more uh, than what the people are. God's getting this ready. And I think before long, there's going to be people coming in. And we know ultimately when the church is restored, you'll have to have hundreds of churches like this all in this area. To fit everybody in here, there'll be many, 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 many people come in. But we're preparing. And it's a spe that makes you a special person. You've borne the heat, and we've borne the heat of this time of restoration. God's restoring the church, and it's not easy. You know, when a church is restored, of course, you'll come in. There'll be a, a seven-fold light. And, but people, people will be uh, benefiting from all your labors, from all your faithfulness, from all your ties, from all your work over the years, from all your, all your ministry, all your whatever you've been doing over the years to prepare a place for God's people to come into and be safe. I love that. So does that mean that you're going to get a special award? We all get one penny, which is eternal life. We're all working for the same thing. But it just makes you feel good that God trust you that you can labor a little bit longer in the sun. There was a group of people, and they were standing in the marketplace at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the master of the marketplace came by, and he hired all of them there to go and work in the fields. And he said, you know, I'll give you a penny, which was a day's wages, not an actual penny. I would never go to work for a man in the heat of the day for a penny. <laughs> would you? That just simply means it's a day's wages, enough to feed your family for one day, okay? So they went out, and uh, he came back at 9 o'clock again, and he saw some men standing around. He said, he said, look, he said, why don't you go out and work in my field, and I'll give you the same wages as these men. He would get a penny. They said, okay. So he did that at 12, and he did that at 3 o'clock. And finally, there was one hour left to work, and he went in. Uh, uh, he went into the marketplace, and there was a few men standing around. And he said, he said, why aren't you out in the field working? And they said, well, no man hired us. And he said, well, go to the field, and I'll give you what's fair. I like that. Yeah, I'll give you what's fair. So they went out, and they worked for one hour. Some of those men had been there for 12 hours in the heat of the sun. And some of them had just been there for one hour. At the end of the day, they all lined up for their little penny their day's wages so that they could feed themselves and their family. And of course, the people that started at six in the morning, they got their day's wages. And finally, they came to the people who had been um, only laboring for one hour. And they got the same wages as the men who had uh, been there all day. And the men who had been there all day, they grumbled. They said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. These men, I mean, they just barely had time to pick, pick up their gardening tools or whatever they're doing and then put them down again and wash their hands and, and clock out and they're getting the same thing we did and Jesus said I, I, I don't I'm not doing you wrong you agreed you agreed to to work for a day's wages so do these men and they all got the same pay which is for us would be whether you've been here 40 years whether you've been here 
Uh, how long have you been here, Sister Crow? Seventy years? Not quite. But whether you've been here 70 years or you just came in, we're all going to get the same reward, which is a penny, which is eternal life. And, that's, and, and so that's, that's a wonderful thing there. But the apostles said, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, Jesus, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? They were looking at natural things. They had no idea. They had no idea what was going on. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own words. I like to use this. Jesus kind of told those men, he kind of blew them off. He didn't say it, but he said, look, all these things aren't important right now. These things here, it's not for you to know the time uh, or the seasons which the Father had put in his own words. Later, the apostles would, but right then, the only one who knew what season it was, was, was Christ. Christ came to restore that which he took not away, which was the Holy Ghost. But then he showed them where he was working. He says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the othermost part of the earth. Thank God that Jesus had the understanding of what those men needed. This is not a haphazard thing. It's not the kind of thing where you just get up and you preach a message or teach a mess message or you sing a song because you like it or you know it or it just, you know, you can hit every note or you know all the scriptures. It's a message or a song or a testimony that not only you need but the people need. You have to be able to discern whether you're a minister or a song leader. And we have good song leaders. They're, they're capable of doing that. They know what season it is. Uh, what's that song? It's no time now to sleep. It's time to awake. And God's people are awakening. They're starting to, uh, to see what the season is. But Jesus, so Jesus was guiding those men. And that's what God's ministry is for. You can see that in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. For he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Until... We all come to the unity, the fullness of the stature of Christ Jesus. So they're here to give us those things, to put before us what we need to eat to grow up and become like Christ. And without a ministry that's able to discern the seasons like Christ was able to do, we'll be like someone beating the air. And Psalm says like that, you know. It said, Psalm says this, a well-prepared people the body of Christ is like this, uh, for the path of the just. And a just person is someone who is doing everything that God is dealing with them. They may not be a perfect overcomer, but they're doing what God is asking. And they, they still make mistakes, but, but they pick themselves up and they dust themselves off and they keep going the straight, straight and narrow way. They don't quit, they don't give up. But the path of the just, which is the path is what God is laying out before us right now. We're on a path. The path of the just is as a shining light, which is God's word, illuminated or anointed through the Holy Spirit. You can have the word of God. It won't do you much good without the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the illuminating of the Holy Spirit through the minister that's giving it out and you receiving it in your heart. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more on the perfect day. But the wicked are not so. I used to think that the wicked were the people out in the world. Not really. You can have people right in church, sitting in church, and because the Bible talks, you're either, when you're in church, you're either going to be just or unjust. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that an unjust person is a bad person that's going out. Brother Smith has covered what it means to be just and what it means to be unjust. It's just simply they're doing their own will. There's people, and I don't, I'm not, I think we're, we're good here. We have a lot of good people here. But there are some churches that are going to have people sitting in the pew 
maybe even paying their tithes, you know, and, but, but they're doing, they aren't doing what God has dealt with him to do over and over. They're doing their own will. Uh, they're not going out and robbing cars, but they're not living the life that they know God wants them to live or to do the things that God wants them to do. So the Bible talks about just and unjust. And just, just like the term just is synonymous with these terms, uh, good and faithful, just and holy, uh, uh, overcomer, Brother Smith has covered all those. The term wicked is also synonymous with people that do their own will. Brother Smith has given some of those. Uh, iniquity, a person that does iniquity, um, uh, even evil. So, so when you hear these terms like just and unjust or, or just and wicked, don't think of out there the Bible is really talk, uh, written to, to two women, the, the true church and the unjust uh, church, the, the false church. So, again, it says, the path of the just, that's somebody that's following God with all their heart and, and really trying. We have a saying around my house, never give up, never surrender. That's a person that's following God. And they're never, they're never going to give up. They're never going to surrender. They may stumble. They may stay fall. They make a mistake. But they get up and they ask God to forgive them. And they get back right on that path that God has illuminated. A wicked person, when God illuminates the path in front of them, they're going to stray over here because they don't want to have to pay the price. Did you know there's a price to pay to following uh, God? Uh, this is not easy. That's why... The people in that parable about the penny that started at six were so uncomfortable with the decision to pay those people who had worked for an hour because they had borne the heat of the day. Yet these other people came in. It's not easy. It's not easy to follow God. It takes real men. It takes real women. It'll take all that. Do I do that? It takes all that you have to muster to follow God with all your heart, with all your strength, and all your soul. And, and that's, that's a saying from Paul. So anyway, Jesus, he showed them what he was working on right then, which was for them to go into the city and to get the Holy Ghost, not to answer questions about, are you going to restore the kingdom at that time? That meant nothing. That meant nothing. That wasn't going to help their salvation. Thank God we have men like Jesus it can point the right way now if you go over to Matthew 24 I'm not even going to get to where I was going to talk to brother but we can, we'll just, Matthew 24 uh, Matthew 24 this sure is good coffee isn't it whoever made this did a good job Twenty-four, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. At this time, uh, Herod had, was just about finishing up. He had been restoring. Of course, the first temple was torn down uh, uh, with uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He, uh, he tore all uh, the temple down and Jerusalem down and carried everything away. And then later, uh, Zerubbabel, not Zerubbabel, but uh, uh, Nehemiah and um, Ezra, God stirred them up. They knew what time it was. And God had stirred up not only their hearts, God can let God stir you up. That's what it takes. In fact, in Ezra, it, talk, it, it, it gives a list of everybody who came out of, uh, out of Babylon with Ezra. It talked about Ezra. And uh, all those who heart had uh, that God had stirred up their hearts, let God stir you up. That's what it takes. So they went and they, they rebuilt the temple and then the wall. But the temple was small and it was tiny. In fact, the old men who had seen the temple in its glory, when Ezra got done building it, they wept. Not because they were so happy, but they, they thought, my God, look what we've fallen to. No doubt they, they were happy, but they, re, they remember the splendor 
uh, of Solomon's temple and how God had met them there. And then they see this little, they, the people did as best they could, but the old men wept because they remembered the splendor and the glory. But God stirred up their heart. So here we have, here we have, um, it says, uh, and, and the disciples, they, they were so proud of it. Uh, the, the leader, the governor, had just got done restoring the temple, and it was a beautiful temple. It wasn't as beautiful as Solomon's temple, but yet it was, it was a wondrous thing to see. People came from all over the world to see the temple that Herod had rebuilt, and Herod was proud of it. And these people right then, they were more proud of that temple because they thought Christ is going to come back and he's going to restore temple worship and Israel is going to be restored. And they thought, well, we're going to, in fact, the, same, uh, the, the mother of uh, James and John went to Jesus once and she said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I pray that you would uh, set one son on your right hand and one on the left hand. They didn't know what time it was. They had no idea. And Jesus said, you don't know. You don't even know what you're asking. He said, can you drink the same cup that I'm drinking up? And, and they said, yes. And he said, well, of course, he went on to say, he said, and you will. They were going to have to drink the same thing. But Jesus didn't come to restore natural kingdom. He came to restore that which he took not away. That's the emphasis all throughout the Old Testament for the restoration of the Holy Ghost uh, uh, after Christ went away. Of course, you read about that in Acts 1 and Acts 2. But all the people, they didn't know what season it was. They didn't know what time it was. Jesus did. And the, in verse 2 it said, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Again, he knew what season it was. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, well, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And then he goes on, but Jesus corrected them just like he did in Acts 1. He corrected them again. They were blind. In fact, the Pharisees, they were starting to see things because at one time after Christ, after Christ fed uh, the 5,000 men besides the women and children, um, he got up and he told the people, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And everyone walked away. And they said, this is a hard hearing. Who can say it? And Jesus turned on to the apostles, and he said, will you two also leave? And Peter said, where shall we go? For thou only hast the words of life. And Jesus said, now remember, they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That came later uh, in the second chapter of Acts. Christ hadn't been crucified yet, and he hadn't ascended up to his Father to restore that which he took out of weight. And uh, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. They were starting to get a vision of who Christ was and what he came to do. But without the Holy Ghost, things get so jumbled because we know after Christ was crucified, they all went back to their jobs. They went back to fishing and uh, what they were doing. They just kind of gave up. They were sad, but they thought, well, this is it. He, he, so they didn't know what season it was. I'm telling you, it's important for the ministry to know what season it is so that it's just like uh, Jacob when he was trying to win Rachel uh, for his wife. You all remember that story, how uh, Laban is... Uh, future father-in-law to be uh, told him if you would work with me uh, for me so many years then uh, I'll give you Rachel well he deceived him he got laid and then he had to work another seven years for Rachel but Jacob God gave Jacob understanding and there's no way that you can take a, a willow piece of willow or whatever type of wood it was and you can cut rings in it and and kind of pull off the bark and put it before uh, the cattle and the sheep when they went to, to breed and get that type of uh, uh, animal, whether ring straight or spotted. God gave uh, Jacob understanding of the season and, and God, because God touched Jacob and helped him to know what's going on, he was able to increase until finally it's Laban came and he said, you've taken everything. 
He said, well, I won't, he, he said, you've changed my wages how, how many times, what, like 10 times? But God gave him the understanding to know what season it was, and God blessed it. So if you don't, if you don't know what season it is, and you just start putting out, uh, if you start putting out messages and songs, it may bless to some extent, but it's not going to produce the fruit that it could have. It's just like someone, someone came up to, I think it was, I don't know if it was Brother James Souders or Brother Will Souders, and they said, this was a pastor of a church, and he said, we really need you to come to our church. There's, uh, we're having all kinds of problems. And he said, well, what's the matter? He says, we're having manifestations of evil spirits left and right. It's getting bad in our church. And he said, well, what are you preaching on? He said, well, I'm preaching on evil spirits. I'm trying to get them out of the church. And he said, well, I want you to go back. And for six months, I don't want you, it was either three months or six months, I don't want you to preach on anything but the love of God and the Holy Spirit. And after that time, whether James Souders or Will Souders, I don't remember the story, but he came, went to that church. And he said, how's things here? He says, I don't know what happened, but everything calmed down. I mean, everything is peaceful. We've been having good moves in the spirit. There's no manifestations of evil, evil uh, spirits. See, it wasn't time for that man to start putting all that out. There may be a time when we got to talk about evil spirits, but it wasn't time for that man, but because that man was putting out the wrong thing. And saints, when you put things out from the platform, people eat it. They eat the word of God. That's what the, in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, or is it 17th, that angel came down and had a little book in his hands and he gave it to John. He said, take and eat this. He said, in your mouth, it's going to be sweet as honey, but in your mouth, it's going to be bitter. Well, that's just, that angel came down and gave John that book, which was an understanding and wisdom of all those prophecies and knowledge of what was going to happen. So that angel, whether it was Paul or, or uh, any, one of the apostles, whoever it was, whoever that angel was, gave direction and helped John to know what season it was so that he could work in that season. All I'm saying is there is a season to work in. And we as good uh, uh, stewards of God have to work in that season. Now, real quick, um, wow, took a half hour to get to where I wanted to go. I just want to give you a few things about God's ministry, okay? Turn over to Exodus 30, and you can write these down. I won't be able to expound on them much because we're almost out of time. First off, is there any questions about anything I've said? Because I went pretty quick. And I hope you under, hope you can feel my heart. And this, a little, these scriptures here have a little bit to do with what I'm saying. Exodus, which is in the Old Testament. I used to have it in my Bible. There it is. Exodus 30. God's ministry has a big part. When I first came to the body, I came out of uh, the religious world, and out there they had a, uh, when I was 16, when I got saved, you could still, God's ministry, even out in Babylon, was able to deal uh, with things like standards and doctrines and, and morality. But in a few short years, by the time I got married, uh, they weren't doing that anymore. Uh, that. There became a, uh, a saying that says, oh, you're meddling, preacher. That became very common out there. You're meddling, preacher. Um, so, but uh, things changed. People don't, didn't want to be meddled with. They didn't want their life dealt with anymore. They just wanted to go away feeling good about themselves. Well, sometimes that's not the kind of service that you need. Sometimes you need a, a service that's, that's correction. I remember uh, the, the man that married my wife and I. His name was uh, Vernon Nybach, and good man. He married us, and, and he baptized uh, or, or dedicated Jacob and some other things. And about that time, they had these type of women's dress. They were called sundresses. And 
mostly they were sleeveless. And usually when I was growing up, when you went to church, you went dressed like this. Because you felt like, you know, God is the most important person on the face of the earth, and I'm going to dress up to see him. But people started coming more casual. And then the women had these sundresses, and their shoulders were bare. That It just wasn't what, at that time, you just you didn't wear that to church. It just wasn't acceptable. He got up, and he talked about that one time, how he felt like, it wasn't appropriate to wear that type of a dress. This is a big church, over a thousand people. It wasn't appropriate to wear that to church, that we ought to respect other people. Maybe other people don't want to look at your shoulders that are sitting behind you. You know, maybe they don't want to see this. We ought to respect God a little bit more and come, you know, dressed properly so that if we want to raise our hands, you know, I mean, you got your big old hairy armpit there or something, you know. I mean, you ought to respect God more than that. He got up and he taught. He wasn't even hard. He was very kind about it. About two, sir, about two or three weeks later, the board of deacons got together, and they fired him. They fired him, and he had built that church. He'd been there for a long time, and they fired him because they had this saying, "You're meddling, preacher." Well, that's God's ministry to set the direction for the church, just like Christ set the direction. For the apostles, the 12 apostles, they would also set the directions in their churches. You know, uh, not to be lords over God's people. I'm just talking about the feelings that they have, but what the church needs. Aren't you glad that we have people that can feel what the church needs? I'm thankful for that. I'd be lost without having people over me that was able to discern the times and the seasons. But this is Exodus chapter 30, verse 22 sorry this thing is uh, I'm I'm trying to go faster I really am um, it says moreover the Lord spake unto Moses saying take thou also unto thee this was the, when the people were wandering in the wilderness take thou also unto thee principal spices count them now pure myrrh there's one 500 shekels, sweet cinnamon, that's two, half so much, even 250 shekels, and a sweet calamus, 200 shekels, that's three, and a cassia, 500 shekels, that's four, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, a hen. There's five ingredients that's going to go in, that the, the apothecary is going to blend to a holy anointing oil which goes right along with the five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now, it doesn't mean, one of them says half as much, that doesn't mean that one gift is more important than the other. In fact, Paul said, but ask ye the Lord uh, for the best gift or the better gifts, and the best gift that you need right now is the gift and the season that God is working in. If God is working in the area, it's the season for evangelizing, you know what the best gift is? An evangelist. If he's working in the area or the season of teaching and he wants teaching for the church, it may not be time for an evangelist. You know what the best gift there would be? Can anybody guess? Teacher. If, uh, if, uh, if God's dealing in the area of prophecy, he, might, he, 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 he may not need a whatever, but the best gift that the church could have at that time would be a prophet with the gift of a prophet. So. So when you see things like such as this was only half as much going into this uh, holy anointing oil, don't, don't, don't take that to mean anything. Every gift that comes from God is important and has a place in the kingdom of heaven. And it said, uh, And thou shalt make it oil of holy anointing, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony. They were going to pour it on there. And the table in the holy place, and his vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense. And then they go out into uh, uh, the outer court. And the altar burnt offerings with all of his vessels, and the labor, and his foot. In other words, they were going to make this holy anointing oil, and they were going to pour it on everything. Why? And thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy, and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, 
that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And we're going to read another scripture here, but this is a good type. Everything that happened to them back there, it really did happen. But all those things happened to them for type and shadows to help us down here. So when they took this holy anointing oil and they poured it all over the tabernacle and upon Aaron's and his sons, that is a type of the fivefold ministry because there's five parts of it. Sometimes you have the fivefold ministry in God and Christ, like Mo, uh, Samson had seven uh, ponytails. There were seven golden candlesticks. In Ephesians, you see the fivefold ministry. So, uh, and, and here the, there's five different compounds for this holy anointing oil. Now, we got time for one more scripture. Real quick, go on over to Psalms 133. This is probably one of your favorite scriptures. We've all quoted it. And it also happens to be in the Old Testament. Psalms 133, which happens to be right here. Behold, if you want God's blessing upon a group of people, a body of people, you need these five things that I just read, you know, the, the five, that, that holy anointing oil, because God poured it on the head of Aaron, who was a type of the priesthood, and his sons were type of ministers. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment. We just read that. They made that uh, holy anointing oil, and they poured it on Aaron. This is what that's talking about, which is a type of the five-fold ministry. If you want direction in your life, you need to sit under the five-fold ministry. It is like the precious anointment, uh, ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. Thank God it did. Thank God that anointing, that understanding, that knowledge has come all the way down here, that the same thing that the, that church needed back there 2,000 years ago, we need that same thing here today, which is the five-fold ministry. And what did it do? As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. And what was the blessing? Even life forevermore. That gives me a great hope that we're in a body that recognizes that we need that holy anointing oil and it needs to run all the way down to the skirts of Aaron's garment, which is down here. That's talking about prophetically down here. We need that five-fold ministry. And Brother Smith has talked about it. The church is not fully restored yet. The five-fold ministry is not fully restored yet. But one of these days, and it's not going to be that long, they are, and they're... God is commanding his blessing, which is life evermore. Don't you be going out there to a church that says there's no such thing as a five-fold ministry. You know where that started? With Brother Will Souders. Other churches, other organizations are starting to pick it up. But if we went back in, in, in Exodus 30, chapter 22, if, if you would have ran, read down, because we're out of time, if you would have read down any more, if you would have poured that on man's flesh, it would have been an abomination, and that soul was to be cut off. And also, it was not to be put upon anyone else other than Aaron and his sons and all the, uh, uh, the articles of furniture in the tabernacle. What we have here is not going to work out there. God's blessing is where that holy anointing oil is. I'm so thankful for the body of Christ. This is my home. I'm not leaving. And I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking about churches all over the country that follow after this and now it's getting to all over the world that holy anointing oil and it's going to get greater and greater and greater so that when men stand up they'll speak with authority and heaven will back them up and you'll feel it we're out of time I could go on for maybe two more minutes no not really I could go on for hours like this but uh, let's go upstairs and let's get some of that holy anointing oil flowing on uh, running down Aaron's beard, and let's feel some of it in the skirt of his garment. Thank you for being so attentive. God bless y'all. This is a good coffee.